Welcome to the party. I'm not here right now, but I want you to listen very carefully. These guys are very funny, so pay attention. Enough talk. It's showtime. And welcome to Bags of Action. My name's Steve. My co-host is Pete. Hello. This episode, we're talking about Spencer Confidential from 2020. This is a film on Netflix with Mark Wahlberg, Winston Duke, and Alan Arkin in the leads. Indeed. But before that, what news, Pete? Well, um, I'm sure you've heard that No Time to Die has been pushed back to a November release due to the coronavirus. Now, there was some kind of conspiracy theory-esque kind of talk about how some people think that maybe the test screenings weren't very good because it's a very long-running film, the longest Bond film, I believe. And it was... But I don't know. I mean, it's it's it was tickets were already on sale. It was only a few weeks before it's being released. But from what I can gather industry-wise, I think... Um, the Chinese market these days is very important for these big movies. So the fact that the majority of people in China are staying indoors means there's a huge amount of box office that will be lost. So I think they've really pushed it back just as a just to make sure they get enough bums on seats, I believe. I think that's wise as a precaution. I don't believe the uh, conspiracy theories around it. No. It's a bit too flat no, earth for me. Yeah, I think yeah, exactly. If, if and I don't, if you had issues with test screenings or you didn't think the film was working, you wouldn't have put tickets on sale, and it wouldn't have got that close to the date. That's the kind of thing that happens like three, six months before. Yeah. But I don't think like a matter of weeks. And uh, yeah, if you think about how big the Asian market is for these movies, I mean, some of these films are doing like uh, you know double their numbers for the rest of the world. Um, and I think you know, apparently in China, the gaming stats the highest they've ever been because people are in their houses and their uh, carbon footprint has dropped by 100 metric tons in a, in a 100 million metric tons in like a week so people are literally staying indoors as you'd expect so yeah so the cinema is not going to be high on their priorities right now no no that's fair enough i've got one bit of news and okay. this is on the potential fourth expendables film in the franchise recently randy couture was out promoting his new film final kill and someone asked him about it and he said he got the script last year and he's enjoyed it enjoyed reading it but there isn't any movement in terms of when they're going to make it so he doesn't know if it's actually going to get green lit but there is a script so i have to wait and see i think the third one didn't review as well as the others Mm. and the box office was quite a lot lower the other fact i think at one point sly stallone said he wouldn't do another one then they've kind of persuaded him to come back but he's got his own production company now like the last rambo film was made by that company and his next film is in that company so i wonder if he just wants to do his own things there was another rumor that they might spin off jason statham's character mainly because Hobbs and Shaw did so well but i don't know i don't know if that character in the expendables is strong enough to carry a movie on his own I don't even remember his name. No, neither do I. That's why I'm calling him Jason Statham's character. Um, No, I can't either. I know Barney Ross, and that's about it. But they all had very strange names, though. I remember that. Yeah, 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 I don't know. It's a wait and see. The film hasn't been out for a while now, because it came. the first one was 2010, and then the second one came out very quickly in 2012, and the third one, 2014. So it's now been six years, potentially seven years, when it, if it actually came out next year, yeah. but they'd have to start shooting it soon, and with all of the problems with films and stuff at the moment, uh, and productions of various films have been halted in certain areas. I, I did read, apparently, there was going to be an Expendables TV series at Fox, but they rather than the cast of the movies, it was going to be people like Tom Selleck and people that were in... And like maybe MacGyver and stuff, people that are in TV shows back in the day, right? Like that could have been interesting, but apparently it didn't. It got didn't get out of development. It kind of was an early idea and then didn't go any further. They also said they were going to do an all female version as well at one point. Remember? Yeah, it's true. That it's also true. didn't seem to go anywhere. 
No, I think there was a low budget rip off with Bridget Nielsen and Cynthia Rothrock, but uh, that was about as good as it got. Hmm. Okay. Well, I guess it's a watch this space and see. Um, Stallone's currently busy working on the Samaritan yep. movie at the moment, so it's a case of we we'll see what he does next and if it's going to be the Expendables or something else, or maybe even Creed Three. Now that we know that someone's working on a script, so yeah. Maybe interesting. But potentially, you could have a Creed film and an Expendables film, both of which with no sly, but uh, we shall see. Hmm. Okay. Right. <clears throat> shall we move on to talking about Spencer Confidential? Sounds good. So I will say up front that I'm not really familiar with the character of Spencer. I know that he was created by Robert Parker from the novels. What I didn't realise is that, according to information a quick bit of research that i did there were 40 spencer novels wow. he's quicker writer than you yeah tell me about it <laughs> and then of course there was the tv series in the mid 1980s yeah. i was too young so i'm old i was there no i saw uh, i wasn't it wasn't i think i saw reruns this is my uh get out clause. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course, um, of course. so i i don't remember that i remember like it's one of those things where you go oh i'll watch a bit of it i think i've maybe saw three or four episodes but it ran for three seasons apparently i think mid 80s and mm -hmm. then there were four tv movies up until like the mid 90s so i remember the hawk character um avery brooks of course um, yeah that's the yeah, yeah. link I'm, i have aware of yeah, and obviously it's Robert Ulrich in the in the main part. It's one of those shows I I've got a sense of it, but I don't really like. I wasn't watching this ticking off a list of things. I've seen a few things online where there are people that really like the novels who don't think this is close enough or like the TV show. But I just took it as you know, in its own right, I suppose, to get a face value. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I everything I'm I'm going to talk about is just a case of from the film. I yeah. don't know anything about the characters beyond being familiar with some of the names of Hawk and the others. And I know that the final location for the film, um, Wonderland, has a tie-in to the novels. But apart from that, yeah. I couldn't really tell you anything about it. So uh, I'm not really going to no. touch on that because I'd just be guessing or reading stuff off the wiki page. Same here. So the interesting thing, I think, when I... What, it's interesting how Netflix works because you kind of see a see a trailer or you see an, a very small image in a box mm -hmm. and you go, oh, Mark Wahlberg, oh, Spencer, oh, okay, I'll watch this. And then you suddenly find out who directed it and wrote it, which is a very, you know, I think, you know, for, as cinema fans, you go back years ago, it'd be like, well, who's, who's, who's behind this movie? And now you kind of go, well, this looks interesting. And then you find out more. It's a really weird shift. It's yeah. almost like stumbling across a, a film on TV. So this is directed by Peter Berg. Mm-hmm. Who's the last thing I saw that he did was Mile Twenty Two, did Deepwater Horizon. I also found out from looking on IMDb that he co-wrote the Losers screenplay, but he didn't direct it, which makes me think maybe he was attached as a director early on and then maybe drifted away and got a writing credit potentially. Oh, um, but he was—he's uh, an actor, isn't he? Turned director. He tends to—I don't think he's in this, but in a lot of his films, he tends to make um, little cameos. He did Battleship as well, but I've never seen that. So he also. In terms of directing, you do, if you go back, you did things like Hancock with Will Smith. Oh, of course, um, he did. yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the other ones he's, he's done. Oh, there are some really other, other like, you know, fairly big films with big yeah. names that he's been, you know, attached to. So it's not like he's someone who's come along and said, right, this is my first crack at a big film. No, he's no done near. quite a few a few things yeah. in the past. Um, I think he did. Um, I, that's right. So he did The Kingdom, 2007. So that's Jennifer Garner, oh, Jamie okay. Fox. So that's like yeah, a, yeah. an early version yeah. almost of oh, the Sicario type film. Yeah, yeah, you it know, is. Yeah, kind of I, action yeah. thing. So he's done he's done action before. He's done comedy. He's he's been an actor himself in things like Alias that I've seen him in. Yeah, yeah. I remember Jennifer Garner again. So he's got a connection there. He's worked with her in the past. Um, but yes, he, so he's a well established director. That's yeah. for sure. So then I, I saw the writer's names come up, and the first name came up, and it was someone called Sean O'Keefe, mm -hmm. who I've never heard of. No. Um, and I looked him up, and he's written video games, and he's got, I think, five or six other screenplays in, in development but not been made yet. So this is his first thing to go to screen. Yeah. Um, and he does production. But then I saw the second name. Did you recognize the second name of the second writer? It's familiar, but I couldn't tell you what he's worked so, on. So looking Brian... At Brian Helgeland is one of my favourite screenwriters, so I was quite surprised to see his name on this. So he wrote Conspiracy Theory, which is a film oh, I love. And I, yeah. I have the printed-off old-school script somewhere no, uh, yeah. of that. Um, he wrote and directed, but it wasn't his version that got into cinemas, Payback, 
Yeah. He wrote Man on Fire, Mystic River, uh, did the adaptation of LA Confidential. Mm -hmm. But he's also got some uncredited work, which is, I think, this is obviously credited, but I think he's the kind of writer they bring in to punch up the dialogue and make it and give it a bit more kind of brevity. Right. So he worked on Salt. Oh, yeah, yeah, which we've been uh, Yep, yeah, the Daredevil movie mm -hmm. and Born Supremacy. They're three of his uncredited kind of, a bit like Shane Black on Predator in a way, kind of been brought in to kind of, to to kind of make things a bit more, um, yeah, to make the dialogue sing a little bit more. And there are a few scenes in this that do feel very kind of in his wheelhouse. But it'd be interesting to know how that, which way around. I'm assuming O'Keefe wrote the script and then Helgeland did a rewrite. That would be my 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 guess based yeah. on their experience levels. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I was quite excited at all. And he did, um, we did the, he wrote and directed the Kraus, it called the Craze film with Tom Hardy. Legend. Yeah, yeah, he wrote and directed that as well. Ah. And a Knight's Tale, he wrote and directed that too. Mm. So there again, so, a yeah. well established writer and a well established actor. We've also got a very big name in Mark Wahlberg. He's, he's done a lot of action and he's done a lot of comedy, and this film falls somewhere in between the two, I would say. I would, yes, I would agree. I would agree. Do you recognize the, the actor who plays? Hawk. Yes, from Black Panther. Winston Duke, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So he's in the Avengers films, he's in Black Panther. He's been in films like Us, which was the film um, directed by Jordan Peele, the horror one. Oh, I I've seen Get Out, but I haven't seen Us yet. And also I've okay. seen him in Person of Interest. Uh, Winston Duke was in uh, the last sort of two seasons of that, playing an important character. Mm. So that was... Um, Good to see him doing something a bit different again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, it's, Alan Arkin has been in everything. Everything. Yeah, everything he's everything. a brilliant actor. It's just like I think we've got to we'll jump ahead a bit, but like some of the casting in this, like Alan Arkin, Bakeem Woodbine is in here. He's been in loads of things. Mm -hmm. Mark Maron, who I think is great as well. So it's like, we've talked about this before with a few of these kind of films. These like what I quite like the modern thing now is. You make an action movie, but you put really good actors in it, yeah. not just people that... Saying that, Mark Wahlberg can, can, or his stunt double can certainly handle themselves. <laughs> uh, that's for sure in this movie. I've been really enjoying Alan Arkin in the Kaminsky Method lately. Oh, I still haven't got to that. So funny, and he's so good in it. Now, the unknown name for me is Eliza Schlesinger. Uh, I thought you were going to say Post Malone. Is a stand-up comedian, that okay. I've, been, I've been told. Now, she's done some acting, of course. But from what I've been told, she also does, she's a, she's a stand-up. That um, kind of makes sense because she's very funny and very brassy. Is that a word you can use these yeah. days? Yeah. Um, yeah, she's kind of very upfront. It's it's interesting because the the film is set in Boston, which is where Mark Wahlberg is actually from. Yep. I believe even the film actually opens with a song by the band Boston, just to hammer that home in case anyone <laughs> missed it. Um, and it, it's weird because I I. I watch Ray Donovan. You don't watch that, do you? No. I haven't watched that. So that's a, that's a show which is set in LA and then, then it moves to New York, but it's, it's Liv Schreiber. And the family, the main family in it are from Boston and they're from an area of Boston called Southie, which yeah. I've never heard of before, which I is have. kind of this. Thanks for Goodwill but, Hunting. Uh, well, that's a funny <laughs> point. Isn't it? So Goodwill Hunting and, and this film also has Southie in it as yep. well. So yep. it's kind of. It, and it, yeah, from those three things, I've got a very definite impression of about that part of the world. Mm -hmm. But she really fits in with a lot of this film. Reminds me of Ray Donovan, um, but she really fits in in that kind of upfront, kind of in your face um, woman that's going to not back down and going to be very, very honest with you at all times. Mm. So there are several of her shows apparently on Netflix, which I've not watched. Okay. But it's uh, I don't know what her comedy's like at all, so I can't really really say but she was i thought she was very good as you say in this role of uh playing character sissy who is mark's uh, uh sorry spencer play mark <laughs> wilberg his uh ex sort of on off girlfriend i'd say yeah, they're, they're certainly on at one point in the film <laughs> <laughs> yes they are <laughs> so having said all that and talked about it around it yeah what what did you think of the film I liked it. <laughs> I'm very quiet. <laughs> I liked it. And quiet. I, I liked it. I think it's, it's it's weird when we come to these films completely fresh. Yeah. Because of the nature of you know we're doing a show and it's it's really easy to talk about a film we've seen loads of times. Yeah. And the challenge with this is you're you're watching it, enjoying it, and analysing it at the same time. Mm. But I really enjoyed it. I kind of a part of me part of me feels like is this a guilty pleasure? I'm like, well, why am I feeling guilty if I'm enjoying it? I'm enjoying it, and I think. 
Mark Wahlberg hasn't got the biggest range in the world, but in the right roles, he's really good. And I think this role really suited him. And I think it just kind of, and at times it had that lethal weapon vibe of something very funny happens. And then straight afterwards, something very threatening. Yeah. I don't think the balance was quite as, as, as good, but I, no, I, I, I enjoyed the ride. There's a few scenes that just feel like they've come out of nowhere. Like the sex scene, like the, being chased by a dog for ages seen there's lots of dogs in this film yeah yeah there's probably the most dogs i've seen in a film that isn't about dogs yep but yeah i think i i think i liked it uh (laughs) are you waiting for me to talk you out of it no i don't know i don't know maybe i don't know if i'm you know sometimes when we do these things a bag will be added or removed by the time we finish talking but i'm yeah it's i think because it's an action comedy it's a bit different as well but yeah what what did you think (laughs) i knew that was coming so (laughs) I liked it, but I had some problems with it. Okay. Since watching it, I've then gone and read some other people's reviews of the film. I thought you were going to say the 40 books then. <laughs> yeah, I've now read the 40 books in the week between us talking about it. and uh, So I've, I've read some of the reviews that uh, people have made mm. about this film. And I, I agree with some of their points, but some of them, I think okay. they just need to chill yeah, out, yeah. take a breath, and just stop treating every film like it's got to be, you know, Schindler's yeah. List. Because it, it isn't. It's never designed to be. And while it might not be like the books, I can't comment on that. All I can say is that as a fun action comedy, it's good. If you compare this to something like Six Underground, which was an absolute Trust train that, wreck it? of a film. It's a mess. It's, that's also designed to be an action comedy. This is miles ahead of that. And yeah. I didn't see anybody tatering that nearly as much as they did this in the reviews. Probably because of the connections to the book, probably because of the world it's set in and all the rest of it. But for me, who hasn't read the books, I'm just going to go with what I've seen. And it was pretty good. It's Yeah, you know, I, th- I know what you mean. Like, because I think this, the Adrian, the internet, everyone having a loud voice... Is oh it, people have to go. This is the best film I've ever seen, or the worst film I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. There's no kind of in the middle. Yep. Some things can just be quite good, and I think this was quite good. And I, I again, when I turned my analytical brain off, I was just I was laughing in the right places. I cared what happened to the characters. I enjoyed the action scenes. I had I been like sixteen, seventeen, I would have thought this was amazing. Um, and I don't mean that as is in a bad way. I, I think it's more of a just, you know, cynical older thing. But it, it made me go, oh, do you know what? I want to watch Two Guns again. Yeah. Well, you know, well I, think, I think we're more critical now. as well. It's not just the fact that we've seen more films. I think that that can be good and bad. As you say, when you're 16, you've not seen as many films and you're just going along with the ride. Now we compare it to lots of other things that we've seen. We've seen a lot more of the world as it were so we can reflect on things that are accurate and not whereas when you're 16 you just absorb it for what it is and it's only when you re-watch a film later you and i have our points have tended to go down a bit because we're looking at it and gone oh that's a bit insensitive oh that's not right or that's a bit racist or whatever it might be but 20 years ago you didn't pick up on those things you just thought oh that was hilarious and now I can't watch Mind Your Language and stuff like that anymore. Yeah. So, but at the time, it was perfectly okay. Yeah. And I think there's a bit in here. I was like, oh, they're going to drive the truck now. And that's ridiculous. I thought, well, hang on. I didn't have a problem with the with the monster truck in Roadhouse. So just chill. <laughs> <laughs> they, they missed the trick by not playing Black Betty. I'm assuming they couldn't get the rights to that song to play it when the truck called Black Betty was yeah. being driven. Mm, but um, That's a shame. Yeah. I mean, one thing... One slight negative I had in the first half, if Hawk's character felt super undeve- underdeveloped and almost one dimensional, yeah. you didn't really, you didn't really get to know him. You just kind of got to know other people's view of him. But then I think the second half of the film, they kind of, kind of rectified that. It's one of the best Batman conversations outside of a Batman film. <laughs> it is, yes. I, I don't think they did enough with Hawk. There's that initial thing where they set up where. Spence comes out of prison and finds that he's got a roommate yeah. and uh, his dog, Pearl, likes Hawk more than him because he's yeah, been yeah. there for the last few years and he's looking after him and they're sharing a room and he's not happy about that. And yet, five minutes later, he's training Hawk and then five minutes yeah. after that, they're in a, uh, having lunch somewhere and Hawk's like thanking him. And I'm like, 
okay, so that initial kind of they don't get along thing has basically evaporated. So the un- the antagonism doesn't really exist. <laughs> yeah, you don't get that spikiness, the buddy cop spikiness between them. They just kind of they ignore it, and just brush it under yeah. the carpet. Yeah, and I think there's an element. I suppose Alan Arkin's character is the link between them, and their respect for him is kind of. But it's yeah, that isn't. It's not. It's no, you're right. Those bits aren't particularly well thought through. I mean, it starts. It starts off with a really good and funny fight against the white supremacists in the prison. Yeah, I think you know that made me realise. Okay, yeah, Mark Wahlberg is cut. If this, if it's like this little scrapper of a guy, then he is very well cast. Yeah, to play that part. Yeah, that first fight scene was good. I didn't realise they were white supremacists because none of them had ta- those kind of tattoos on them. A lot of them okay. had tattoos and they were all pretty nasty blokes. And I thought they've been hired by someone or, you know, it's yeah, a yeah. send-off. But it isn't until later you find out who they are. Yeah. But he he does does take a punch very well. Does he does. Spencer, and he knows he how does. to handle himself. Yeah. Um, and the guy starts kicking him. He's like, are you kicking me? What, what, what are you doing? <laughs> Did you kick me? Which I thought was quite funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, you learn a punch first, and then you can kick, as he says to to Cork later on. Yes, and I think that you know, Hawk's arc is almost he can't punch, even though he wants to do MMA, and he's huge. Yep. But then he somehow gets coached by Spencer, which doesn't really. At that point, I was like, this feels like a TV show. It felt really slow build and no real plot. Yeah. And then the second half, they kind of ramp up the plot a lot. Yeah, it's kind of. Yeah, but it's it's interesting. Like I said, you know, the leaf weapon bit before. There are some scenes you just think like the toilet fight. You know, it feels a little bit Shane Black. Mm-hmm. Then the toilet sex scene felt a little bit like Crank. It does kind of. It probably like if twenty percent of it was a little bit more aligned with itself, if that makes sense. Right. I think it would have been stronger. There's a few little scenes you just go. That doesn't really. So you said you had some reservations before. So yeah, was that yeah. so Hawk, the Hawk character being underdeveloped? Was that one of them? Yes, I think they could have done a lot more with with him we know that the actor is capable i've seen him in other things as i've said and i know that he's very good at playing different kind of things yeah yes he's a big guy and yes he plays a tough guy but they don't really do much much with it as you say we know that he's training and he wants to be a fighter he likes his music he mentioned see they start to do stuff so there's a thing like he has that conversation with spencer whilst they're having lunch about his dad and he starts to go into his background yeah and then don't go anywhere with it and he said oh, I don't want to talk about that and he says fair enough and I'm like okay so why do we touch on that it's that thing of if you show the thing in the first scene you've got to pay it off later on yeah it's yeah. like his replacement part the guy who's partners with Driscoll who replaces him yeah there's a scene of him at the door being an absolute arsehole and you think okay that's somehow I don't think we saw him again after that no we didn't no and I just think well it feels like on the cutting room floor there's a scene of him knocking him out yeah or saying something clever to him or or something. But I don't know, maybe his role there at the time is to kind of maybe divert you away from Driscoll. So you think, oh, he's a decent guy with this, you know, not very nice partner rather than him being the one pulling the strings. Yeah, yeah. So the start of the film, there's a lot of, it's not set up, but they, so they tell it in a non-linear fashion. We see that he's getting out of prison and then we go back to find out why he was put there in the first place with the the stuff to do with uh, the punching out punching out his boss on yeah. the front lawn of his house for one reason that we thought. But then we go back a second time. So that's another kind of problem that I had that I understand why they did it in one way, one reason, because you're revisiting it to find out there's actually more to the scene than we thought the first time around, we just thought he was punching his boss because he's upset about one thing and his boss was beating his wife. Yeah. That's why he did it. But then you go back and find out it's more than that. And it's, it's that thing of if it's, if it's a PI and you're investigating stuff in a novel, it's fairly linear because it, that's just the way things tend to be. A leads to B leads to C. You find a clue. It does this, you go to someone else. Um, so that was another problem I had with the, with the film that, it jumps around a lot. At one point, he has been a PI because he goes to, even though he says, oh, Driscoll says, oh, you're being a private investigator now? And he's like, ha, 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 ha. But then he tells Driscoll everything, which was, I thought, a bit stupid. Yeah. I know you probably think, oh, he trusts his old partner, but it just seems stupid like he'd give him everything, having then known that Driscoll had been there because he'd seen the toothpick. So I, I think 
that they could have done it in a li more linear fashion, but then I guess they wanted it to start with something a bit more exciting than having a fight in the prison, does it? Yeah, because yeah, because you almost work you're working kind of past, present, and then almost future because it's it, it's him in the prison. Then you find out what why he was in prison, and then you find out what happens to his captain on the day he's released. So it's, there's quite a lot to take on board at the start, and it does feel like Spencer's going to get blamed for killing him because he gets killed with a machete. Machetes a lot in this film, but it's not really about that either. Yeah, I know what you mean. I I didn't know if they were trying to keep kind of giving you flashbacks with more information as if as Spencer learnt more, we saw more. Because there's a scene where he listens to a wire uh, recording. Yeah. But we actually see that scene. He's listening to it, I guess, picturing it in his head, and we see that. So I didn't know if they were trying to say that as he pieces stuff together, his memories will start to change because he's starting to, to expand on what he saw, and then we're getting to experience that as well. But... If that's what it was, it wasn't that clear. I think that's a case of the differences between the books and the film, because if it was in a book, you just have the dialogue and the page, whereas because yeah. it, it's on a film, you can't have Mark Wahlberg sat in a, in a car for five minutes listening to something. You can't no. you can't just do that. You have to show it. So that's why I think they that's just a thing, a translation from the different medium. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> slight deviation, but it, it's relevant. I've currently been reading and reading the Expanse books, which are a series of sci-fi novels, and then going back and watching the TV series and seeing the differences, seeing what they've changed and thinking about the reasons why and the way mm -hmm. you communicate things. And so looking at this, I think that's another example of you can't have them just sat in the car listening to stuff. Whereas if you show it and then you do the fade too and they actually show yeah. you what he's listening to, it's a lot more visually interesting for the viewer. So I think that's why it was done rather than it being particularly being, you know, a clue to show you more. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, but as you say, there is a lot of jumping around. The other thing that we then have another jump back, which is later on when we, when we find, uh, I want to call him Charlie Brown, tracksuit Charlie Brown, is it? Uh, oh, no, it's tracksuit something. Yeah. Anyway, but w whatever he's called, the, the kind of something Charlie Brown ca character. And then we have to jump back to find out why Spence doesn't like him. Yes, and I, I think I think that was one one too much. I think if they just said he's a really dodgy guy, he's responsible for for killing someone, and I know it, but I can't prove it, that would have been you know enough. But we get we get a lot of that, so that then that gives um, Hawk a reason to go and do something a bit more. Which just it, see, I know he loves animals because he loves Pearl the dog, and obviously loves a cat as well because he carves it into the guy's car. But it seemed like one step too far when you're just building momentum in the present to then jump back into the past again. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it's the kind of thing that, you know, if it's an Edgar Wright movie or if it's a Guy Ritchie movie, they do that, you know, they might be doing that all the time and it becomes the thing of the film. You yeah. know, it's the way that the film is done. But it wasn't really, it was just kind of, it, was, it wasn't done enough to make it a thing. It wasn't like Polar or something like that, which has got that kind of stylistic thing to it. It felt like it was one of the many things they were throwing at us. Yeah. Yeah. So we then find out that obviously the, the cops are crooked. We find out that his ex-partner's crooked. We find out that the four guys that beat him up in the uh, toilets, at least one of them is crooked. Mm -hmm. And they're all involved in something. But then becomes a question of, well, what are they involved in? And what is it all about? And, who killed Captain Boylan, who he doesn't like, but equally, uh, no one's no one's potentially po pointing the finger at him. He's a suspect, kind of. They, cause... Yeah, they kind of mention it always, what a coincidence the day you come out. It's like, well, I think that's more than a coincidence. That feels like, you know, there's enough motive to at least have a conversation with him mm. in an official capacity, which doesn't happen. Yeah, there's a few things like that where you kind of... It's good to keep you on your toes. It doesn't give you the things that you're, you know, expecting. But at the same time, you kind of go, well, why didn't that thing get sorted out? Yeah. So well, if, why wasn't that more of a thing than they, they're alluding to? That's that's what I was going towards. That if they say that, you know, it happens, they set it up so it happened on the day that he came out. If, if, it, if it was coincidence for them to kill him and just happened to be on that day, that's really unfortunate and a bit silly. If they'd done it on purpose and planted Sorry. a bloody cleaver at his house, even if it was later disproven that it wasn't him, it puts more pressure on yeah. Spencer, and it would and raise it, the it stakes, would, but they don't do that. Yeah, and it, 
No, and it would have given him much more of a motive to do what he's doing. Yeah, because um, it's almost like he's and the he's, other guy. Because. Yeah, because his whole thing is I'm going to learn to drive a truck and then I'm going to leave. And then it's almost like, well, this interesting case is making me stay. But it would also help to say about making that kind of rise in tension thing. But the the partner who is killed, who they pin it on. Yeah. Like if his wife thought that Spencer had killed him, that would have made that dynamic a bit more interesting as well. Because he'd have had to f- work a lot harder to convince him, convince her, sorry, that, that he's actually there to help. Yeah. Yeah, this it, is it just all like valid points. Unfortunate coincidence, which you sh- I, I, I shouldn't, I don't think you should have, yeah. and then roll Spencer into it. Uh, and you know, his part, his ex partner could have there again. It, it created more tension because he was involved and he was there, whereas he could have gone, no, 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 it's not Spencer, but he's the one that's actually planted the cleaver at his house, or they find it in his garden, or whatever it might be, you know. So that thing of he's playing both sides against each other and distracting everybody from the truth, which is he's involved. So yeah. th- there's a lot of good stuff there yeah. that I think they could have used, but they didn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I don't know why it's then in the film at all. It's interesting as well because you know it happens a lot in films, but like he he kind of lets Driscoll know on purpose that he knows he's involved, yeah, almost to kind of um, tease him out by. But there didn't seem to be a reason for that either, specifically. I guess it helped him find out more information. But, yeah, I know what you mean. It's... He didn't then follow Driscoll, though, did he, after that? No, no. <laughs> to see where he's going or to see who he spoke to or... No, he just went to get the van, basically, and after the went after the merchandise. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's, an odd, it's an odd one. When he knows that they're coming after him, he obviously tries to go and protect Henry and Henry's not there because they've already got to him. So he's, he constantly seems to be one step behind everybody else. He's not the brightest spark, but we know no. that he's doing the best that he can. Sissy says that, you know, you've got the right, you, you've got this noble kind of can't give up spirit, which is nice, but equally gets you in a lot of trouble. Um, and Hawk says to him, you seem to get a beat up a lot. But every time it happens, you come away with a bit more information. So he's just stumbling from one thing to another whilst trying to do his best. And I guess that's part of the character and part of the charm is that he isn't the brightest, he isn't the best, he isn't the strongest, but he always seems to get through and find yeah. the right answers or help the right people. Which he's, is... he's like a dog with a bone, which is why they put so many dogs in the film. <laughs> <laughs> They're only two, well, okay. I was going to say there are only two, but there's... No, there's, there's a room full of dogs. Uh, yeah, she, she runs a dog. In fairness, she does walk or look after dogs. Yeah. But, you know, She's an a, independent a, entrepreneur, remember, Pete? This is true. This is true. But then, you know, he gets quite badly, you know, attacked by a dog, and then you get the dogs looking... It's a yep. drug, drug-sniffing dog and stuff. Yep. It's kind of, yeah. We should focus on some of the good. I enjoyed this film, but it doesn't. I don't. The way we're talking about it, I feel like I didn't, but I know I did. I know I did. Tell me about some of the things you liked. I just thought it was very funny. I thought there were times it wasn't like the world's most sparkling dialogue, but I think that some of the things again it helps the people. Like Alan Arkin is brilliant Mm -hmm. and very dry. Mark Maron, I could watch in virtually anything. I thought he was really well cast as the journalist. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just things like that. I mean, yes, it was kind of obvious, and yes, it was in the trailer, but, like, when um, Spencer goes into all the Mexican food and then the machete guys are attacking him mm-hmm. and Hawk is outside with his headphones on so he doesn't hear it. Yeah. And then he reverses the car in. That felt, you know, it felt like a very old-school action movie, action comedy set piece. Yeah. But I thought that was good. And I thought, you know, so the 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 again, all the fight, all the fights I thought were good. To be fair, they weren't not particularly long because it tended to be he'd yeah, like you say, he'd try his best then get knocked out or knocked over, or something would change. But um, yeah, I like. So they were, I thought those bits were good. I like Hawk's fight with about the four blokes in the uh, kitchens. Oh, and at the end, yeah, when he when he, he kind of he punches a couple yeah, of them yeah. out, and then he goes, yeah, that's how you punch. That's how you do it. Um, and then there's that one guy that's left with a machete and he just kind of looks at him and is like, come on then. And the bloke just drops it and runs off. <laughs> there's a nice moment where so the, the lady whose cop husband has, has died and then not only have the cops killed her husband, they've also then turned her house over looking for what it turns out to be the wire. Yep. And that was quite, a, I thought, again, that thing of like comedy and then emotional moments. I thought that was quite, because you, you did put yourself in their shoes and think, oh, they've been through enough. 
you know, let all this. And the little boy's looking at his bed, which has been tipped over. And he just turns to Hawk and says, are you a giant? And he's like, maybe. And he's like, are you a good one or a bad one? And he goes, I'm a good one. And he goes, could you help me turn over my bed? Yeah. And I just thought that was a really sweet moment in, a, in amongst all the chaos, really. Yeah, yeah. There, there, were, there were some touching moments, like when she finds a husband dead in the car and just completely loses yeah. it. Because that, when that scene begins, you have no idea who she is or what's going on. No. Or what the connection is. You just kind of dropped into it because you've just been following Haw- uh, you know, Spencer up to that point, really. And then suddenly you've got this other strand of the story coming in. Um, I mean, they, they did just try to do lots of weird little character moments. So when, like, Captain Boylan, before he's attacked and before he goes to the school bus yard, he's on the phone to his daughter about her homework. Yeah. Do you remember this? And he's going, no, yeah, no, yeah. I think you've really done really well, dear, and this, that, and the other. And I was like, what? And it, it, it just felt, I understand what they were trying no, to do, I... like, show that he's not a bad guy. And then later on they say... The other cop was saying to him, oh, he's, he's a good cop. He did really well. He's, he's really good at this and good at that. And he's not a bad man. So then you begin to wonder, you know, if he's a, a father and a good husband and a good boss, why was he killed? But equally, Spencer yeah. knows that he's crooked. So I don't know. But, yeah, because it's not even as if, because when, when you find out that he's kind of giving his partner evidence to give to the feds. He doesn't feel like he's doing that because he's like, oh, my daughter, I feel bad about how I treated my wife or this. I want to change. He's just backed into a corner and has got no choice. And I, and I think with the homework, you almost I was waiting for, again, the writer me was waiting for, at some point, the subject of that homework is going to be a clue <laughs> or something or linked to something. No, it was just like a little... Yeah, you know, there is that thing and people say, you know, give, give, you, you know, give your incidental characters an eye patch or a limp or... Uh, an interesting hobby um just to stop them being bland but i get but it's it's weird when it's kind of it doesn't feel like there's any reason for it the other thing i found was that you know the feds were being fed this information yeah and then he goes to them with that information and they go oh it's not enough yeah and they didn't really say why they just went it's not enough and i thought oh are they crooked um i mean one of the feds does get a funny scene at the end when they find all the drugs one of the feds is very weird like I thought he was a comedy actor, or there's something, you know, because he seemed yeah, so yeah. over the top, his character. I've looked him up. He's not. He's just a normal actor, but his character is so bizarre. Yeah. It just felt like a caricature of, of someone, and I don't know why he was done that way. Yeah. It was interesting as well, because Brian Helgeland um, did some of the writing on this and wrote Payback. Well, Payback has got two feds yeah. that are trailing the main guy. And then he goes back to and gets, so there was really weird parallels with that. But again, it was like, oh, we've introduced these feds. Oh, that must be really important. Is it, or is it just a way of getting this wire bit in? Okay, no, okay. Well, we, if we take him, then the evidence it's sorted. Oh, take the evidence. Oh, no, it's not enough evidence. That I just felt it. There's there's a few things that felt a little bit contrived just to keep the story moving. Hmm. I mean, it was quite it was quite clever that like the Boyland, despite being like a dodgy cop and a wife beater, gets the state funeral. And then the partner, who actually was a decent guy because he's suspected, doesn't get one. And then at the end, they find out he's going to have a state funeral. That that kind of those little things are nice. I thought, yeah, yeah good payoffs. Yeah, but I, and then you know we jump right to the end, I guess. But it's it's very much set up for a sequel. Yeah, because they they put that bin in about his friend who is someone from school that he knows who is a good guy, and yet now he's been accused of something else. And Spencer's like, no, no. It, I, it's definitely not him. It's definitely not him. And all of his friends want him to leave it alone. But they basically set that up so that he then goes on to another case. Yeah. So I, I was trying to work out, it's like, are they basically saying, we're going to do a sequel? Are they doing a bit of a nod and a wink too? Well, this used to be a TV show. Because at times, I almost feel like they're intentionally making it feel like an old school TV show. Because And then that bit, it's almost like, it is that kind of look to camera, kind of end of the fall guy, kind of, you know, oh, here we go again, which... So, yeah, I'm trying to work out if it was like a meta thing or not. I was disappointed in a way that neither of the TV show actors made a cameo, because that's usually the thing in these things, isn't it? Like in Starsky and Hutch or whatever, you get, you know, they do the film version of an old show and then you get at least one of the people back. Well, they could have had Uh, every Brooks in, but they couldn't have had the main guy. uh, Has he passed away? He passed away, yeah. Robert Ulrich's cast passed away. Awkward. Um, Yeah. (laughs) That what a way been, to tell me! What a way to tell me, Steve. A little, a little bit tougher. Um, yeah, yeah. They, they sometimes get them in. 
I don't Actually, know. There was there was a Hawk spin-off show that ran for a couple of seasons after the the main show finished with so uh, with, Avery with, with Avery Brooks. Yeah, yeah. Wow. A man, called, a man called Hawk, I believe it was called. Wow. I really missed out on this stuff in the eighties. <laughs> I was too busy. I don't know, playing in the park, not watching television. <laughs> Did you watch Hardcastle and McCormick? That's probably too nope. early for you as well. Nope, oh. didn't watch them either. Scarecrow, Mrs. King. I know the name. Never watched it. Uh, Remington Steel. Same again. No name. Uh, okay. I am. I am. The, the, the couple of years difference between us is very important. <laughs> <laughs> it's showing your you age. Know. Showing and I was yeah. from such a rural area. I literally had no way of going anywhere. So it's like TV again then. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. As. Uh, peep into Pete's childhood mm. okay uh, yep. <laughs> real insight real <laughs> thanks uh, yeah so the, the the big kind of end scene is all to do with this wonderland that was a dog track that's now abandoned and they're going to turn it into a giant See, another casino. dog track another dog related thing yeah yeah everyone loves dogs yeah um, you can kill as many people as you want but if you hurt an animal ooh. well Interestingly, that goes back to the re- payback in the because I watched the director's cut of that the other day, which is the Helgland version. Yeah. The dog does die. Uh, in the Mel Gibson version, yep. where he locked him out of the edit suite and got it re-edited, the dog survived. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that wasn't that wasn't the only change in the film. That oh, been, I thought that he said okay. that was the only change. No, oh, that was that was one of the one of the main changes. Oh, quite different. Okay. Though, but. Uh, yeah, so they're all going to get rid of the dog track and they're going to build this casino and you've got crooked cops putting money in. You've got the drug dealers who are going to be supplying the drugs. You've got the Trinidadians who've got the muscle, I guess, with the uh, uh, cleavers. Um, yeah. And it's all bent towards this. And this is what they were kind of covering up. And you've got a whole ring of dirty cops involved and Boylan was going to tell the, the uh, feds but as you said not because he's a good guy not because he wants to help out people but the fact that he had no choice really he, and he wanted a deal he wanted to get the best deal he could yeah yeah whereas uh, Driscoll just seems to be doing it because he's a bit of an arse to be honest yeah despite the fact that you, there again you could get a bit of a scene with him and his son saying you must do this oh yes sir and you, you shouldn't shouldn't do that yes sir and then straight away Spencer's there and it just kind of undermines it because you realise that Driscoll's dodgy yeah, and again, his son is watching that conversation, yeah. but for no real reason. Yeah. It does almost feel like there's another version of this film that's about half an hour longer, where mm-hmm. all these little character things are, are more meaningful. Unless it is literally to go, anyone who's a parent has more than one side to them. I don't know. It does feel a little bit... I think the central relationship between um, was it Sissy and yep. Spencer is quite well done. Mm-hmm. Because it is that kind of almost love hate thing, and and it's quite cleverly. Well, the trailer actually makes it look like she left him for someone else. Yeah. When he was in in prison, but you it turns out that she's like, well, I couldn't just wait for you, but she did. It's kind of it's quite cleverly kind of turned a little bit, and their relationship is quite interesting. Well, sort um, of, but she's also on a date with someone when she then true. corners him in the bathroom, and it's like, a, whoa! I'd, forgot, okay. I'd forgotten that. I'd forgotten that fact that, that he ended yeah. up in the same restaurant as her by choice. Yeah, she's yeah, like, yeah. Are "You following me?" And he's like, "Well, you yeah, followed yeah. me into the toilet, so no. <laughs> Are you following me?" <laughs> but yes, yeah, she was on a de- on a date with someone else, which is um, okay. Not what you'd expect, but clearly she still has feelings for him. Yes, and she knows him better than anyone else because she proves it several times and he said she says do you know what i like it's the five minutes afterwards where she has clarity of thought and so does he and they can actually talk without fighting yeah uh, and which they do and then they get some home truths that kind of come out so there's some good moments in this film but as you say there's a lot of weird inconsistencies that really bothered me them mm. showing stuff and never doing it you know paying them off yeah I know what you mean. So, is there anything you know, else? I, I've never heard anyone called an enabling Alfred before, though. <laughs> and that scene I thought was beautifully done with the kind on, of you're Batman, you're, you're, ba- you're Batman, you're Batman, and he's Robin. I'm not Robin. Yes, you are. You're Robin. Who am I then? You're Alfred. You're not. You're an enabling Alfred. It just really, it's got a like really fast dialogue, and I just thought it was very funny. Yes, I did laugh at that. I admit. Yeah, yeah. There, there were. A, I was expecting it to be funnier, to be honest. Okay. Um, there were some bits where I did laugh, and there's some bits that you know uh, were amusing. But I thought it would be a lot funnier. Maybe that was just a misconception on my part coming into it. But um, the trailer set it up to be more lethal weapony, I guess. 
Yeah, I think there, there are some bits that maybe that didn't, there's some jokes that didn't land. Like they're in the van and they've got the two guys and they're, you know, they're hitting their heads and stuff. It's all very kind of um, three stooges. And then, which again is the equipment, um, but then they realize there's another third guy in the in the back. Yeah. It's, it's stuff like that, which are kind of, I guess, are played for laughs, but it maybe not in the right scenes, really. Yeah, I, I find it quite funny at times. I don't know if it's, it's, it's I think there's just quite a charming set of, characters that right. kind of helped helped kind of keep it going keep it moving along okay so is there anything else you want to cover or do you want to talk about some scores no i think that's probably we've got, we yeah that's probably it i don't think there's much else to say no not without going through the whole film which we don't yeah, do yeah. anymore no. okay i'm gonna let you go first because i've got Ooh. an idea of what your score is going to be and i know you what have. mine is but, okay but let's you, see if i'm right write it right in an envelope Put I'll it behind your back you. yep. and post it to me and I will look at it on the next episode. Okay. Okay. So Off you go. I went into this with no expectation whatsoever. I knew that it was related to a TV show I'd seen a couple of episodes of, but not, I didn't remember it well enough to know much apart from the names of the two main characters. Yep. I like Mark Wahlberg in some films, not so much in others, but he's, he, you know, he, in certain films, like I like the modern Italian job. I may be the only person that does. Yep. Um, but it's that kind of, you know, <laughs> the kind of, nice. The kind of, you know, the way he is here, I think it suits him. I like the fact it's set in Boston. It's a bit different from other movies. I thought some of it was very funny um, possibly more so than you did. I, it just was a bit old school fun, really. And that, more of these kind of films is a good thing, I think. It makes me happy to watch films like this yeah. rather than something that's too dour and too kind of um, caught up in its own self-importance. There are some issues with it. It certainly is not perfect. It is a little bit kind of all over the shop at times. There are a couple of scenes we just we just look at the screen and go, why? Mm-hmm. But with all that considered, I'm going to give it a solid three bags of action. I knew that's what you were going to give it. <laughs> Well, there's only well, five to down choose in the envelope. from. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's what I've written down in the envelope. I'll post it to you so you can have proof. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. you I said it. I'm not sure you could be writing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not a video call. Yep, that's right. Okay. So I wasn't familiar with the stuff with the the books or Parker. Uh, so I'm basing it purely on this. I think the film had a lot of potential. I think they came in with the best intentions of making it a comedy action sort of thriller with some PI aspects because of the, the kind of the origin of the character and the way he's digging into things relentlessly. I think Mark Wahlberg was, was good in the role, but he, he didn't seem to have a lot to do given that he was the lead character. He did a lot of standing around and staring at stuff. I think Hawk was underused. Definitely Winston uh, Duke was underused. Um, I think because there's a lot more with him we talked about some of the inconsistencies. They show things and then don't pay them off. Little character moments are a bit odd. Yeah, but it's it's fun. It's entertaining. It kept me focused for the whole of the film. It's, what, under two hours long, I think. So it's not exactly a, a really long film. But, yeah, it was, it was all right. It was okay. I, it's, it's, I'd say it's, it's, a, it's entertaining but fairly forgettable. I could watch it in like two years time and go, yeah, that was all right. And not really remember too much about it. Like there aren't any moments that will particularly stand out. Perhaps the fight at the start of the film, perhaps the fight in the Mexican restaurant or the, the one in the kitchen will stand out, mm. but I'm not going to say, Oh, there was that brilliant scene where, you know, they talk about their dads and, and cause it just, it didn't, it didn't have that, you know, the emotional weight, I think. Okay. So given all of that, and because we don't do half bags and the way yep. we score things, I'm going to give it two bags. Ooh, okay. It sounds mean and sounds tough, but given what we've given three for some other films, I just don't think it's it's there. It's all right. Three is, uh, two was, it was okay for me. Three is, it was good. Four was, it was amazing. And five was, this is the best film to slice bread. So no, half bag. two is, no half bags is tough. That's it. Sometimes. So, so, so to, I'm saying two. It was okay. That's mm-hmm. that's it. I think. Okay. Well, I think that you know that, that the the two to three variance between us is, mm-hmm. is is sums us up. I think that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So, have you seen Spencer Confidential? Have you watched it recently on Netflix? It only came out in the last few days. Uh, have you read any of the books? What are your thoughts? Don't get too heavy on that because obviously this is quite a different thing and we're not as familiar. But get in touch with us and let us know. You can email us. You can come onto the Facebook group and talk about it there. Uh, we're on Twitter. Uh, don't forget to go into iTunes to leave us a review. Yeah, I think that's it for now. Right, yeah. Pete? Wrap us up. Uh, thank you for listening, if indeed you still are. Good night. Good night. You have been listening to Bags of Action. No bullshit. You'd better stick around for the next episode, because if you're lying, I'll be back.